Welcome to Winnipeg Internet Pundits, where the brain trust of Winnipeg's blogosphere comes to deliver your fix of urban issues, current affairs, and all the local politics that we can handle in our new format with more bloggers than ever before seen together. Tweet us during the show at Internet Pundits. We have a jam-packed show today, but first up, uh, we have on the line Diana Owen. Hello. Hi. You're in town today speaking at the Winnipeg Free Press Cafe about politics and social media. So can you just sum up your, your research for us? Yeah, I do a lot of research that looks at how candidates, political parties, and other kinds of political groups are using uh, new media and social media in campaigns and in government in general. I'm also really interested in how young people are making use of these kinds of tools and whether it's really helping uh, to contribute to their being more engaged in politics. So I, as far as I've seen so far from our numbers here in Canada, um, obviously we have a pretty high adoption rate of, of social media technologies, especially among young people, but that's not translating into voting so far. So what do you make of that? Yeah, that's exactly the pattern that we uh, are seeing in the United States. Um, I, I actually think that you know it, it, it's it's a lot a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, young people are not resonating or the issues that are out there for young people are not necessarily uh, kind of resonating through uh, social media channels that a lot of um, what goes on there is highly personalized highly negative um, not really well structured or organized so uh, I think it's just First of all, it's hard to get young people engaged in politics that they think is so removed from, you know, kind of their daily lives and the things that they're concerned about. And, you know, it's no different in the social media realm. Okay. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in with a question here? we got a room full of pundits who uh, are all active online and, and sort of trying to make a contribution as citizen journalists here. Perhaps yeah. I'll jump in. Uh, Kevin McDougall from The View from 7 blog, the from 7wordpresscom uh, Diana, I was just wondering, Is I, I did a blog post a while back that looked at uh, low ver- voter turnout and noted that there seemed to be some evidence that low voter turnout or high voter turnout is linked to trust. The more trusting people are in their communities and in their institutions, the more likely they are to vote. Is there any way that social media could build up trust levels? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, a student uh, of mine has just completed a big thesis that looks at whether you can use social media to build uh, trust in government. And what she focused on was the ways that uh, the government might be reaching out to people through social media from agency websites. And what she found is that um, the more interaction that uh, the public had, that citizens had, um, through social media, but also by going directly to websites and blogs that were sponsored by the government, the more uh, efficacious they felt, the fact that they, you know, believed that they could influence government and politics, and they also, importantly, um, developed a higher level of trust in government. They seemed to like the things that they were finding there. The resources were good. They felt uh, that even through social media that, uh, and that it's very limited in the U.S., the extent to which social media is really used in government agencies. They're a little bit uh, kind of worried about uh, really going heavily in that direction. You know, it's, it's very uneven across the different agencies, but where it is done, um, it's, it's been very effective in building trust, and uh, I really think that that's uh, a, a very important aspect of social media. It can be used to, um, to develop trust. I'm not so sure that happens in the campaign context because of the nature of the discourse that goes on there, but for things like, um, it sounds like you're dealing with um, here on this program, community building and, you know, concern about issues that uh, that people who live in Winnipeg are, are concerned about, I think that there's a way of using social media to build trust, particularly if a lot of um, what's happening there is positive, it's resource-based, and, you know, really helps citizens to understand what's going on and, and maybe provide them with some services or link them with services. I find myself really excited about that potential, and I think that can really happen. But what we've seen so far is sort of the other end of the stick. So uh, case in point, we've had a few Canadian politicians swearing at people, at their constituents over the Twitter. Um, And journalists. And journalists, (laughs) other journalists. And uh, there was a a boxing match between a couple of politicians that was seemed to really be a social media event. And I didn't really understand why they would want to take it in that way. So is that a concern that it's going to be take away from that trust through these sorts of things by getting more direct access to what politicians are really thinking? 
Yeah, it's it, you know, it's it's interesting. It seems to differ whatever realm you're looking at. So in the electoral realm, I would say that's almost at the bottom of the barrel. That so much of what goes on there is personalized and negative, and and you know really turns a lot of people off. Uh, they get tired of it. Even people that are attentive to politics, or you know, get sick of it. You don't learn much after a while, and it's just one candidate being up on another candidate. I think on the real positive end um, of the stick, which uh, is what my student was researching, and uh, and I've seen just a, a little bit of other evidence building in that direction, is when government agencies are really using social media effectively. Politicians, it's really been a mixed bag. Um, a lot of, uh, not a lot, but recently a number of, of prominent American politicians have basically discontinued using social media or have become very li- very limited in the way that they're using it because. It's very difficult to get, um, you know, particularly on Twitter, where you have such a limited number of characters that you can use to get a message across. It's really difficult to use that on its own to, to um, in, a, in a real serious way to engage people. So what happens is um, Twitter becomes the most negative way of getting information out there. What, the discourse on Twitter is by far is much more, far more negative than on Facebook or in any other form of social media that you know is, is regularly tracked. And uh, I agree with you. The fact is that, you know, some politicians have used it unwisely. Some politicians, you know, have um, perhaps through hubris or just, you know, they didn't consider the consequences in the U.S. have have lost their careers because of that. Anthony Weiner is an example of it, um, doing really silly or ridiculous things uh, through uh, through social media. And uh, the example I've heard of the examples that uh, that you've been describing, politicians using really bad swear words uh, i you know i haven't seen that necessarily get publicized that it's happened in the u.s yet but you know there have been similar kinds of slip-ups so i would agree with you the problem um with some social media is that you know it's it's just so quick and dirty and it's it's very tricky to use effectively and what happens is that you just get something that's not necessarily promoting trust but um maybe even undermining uh, faith in politicians when they behave badly on these uh, social media channels. Diane, uh, Diane, if I could just take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, This is uh, Walter Kralik. And, uh, you know, it's become almost a bit of a a cliche in in Canadian politics in recent years that whenever a a major issue that really catches uh, uh, the public's uh, public's interest uh, happens to, uh, you know, happens to hit the front page, you, you kind of get the emergence of, of you know, these of, of Facebook groups and, and other sort of online uh, uh, gatherings of, of people who, who are really passionate about an issue. And it's it's kind of interesting because over the last number of years, and we've read a lot about decreasing levels of, of citizen engagement, uh, you know, lower voter turnouts, uh, uh, decreasing levels of, of membership in political parties but it's clear you know from from these types of online responses uh quite often you know very issue driven very specific uh that there is you know I, I think a lot of attention being paid by the public to you know to these these issues on sort of a, a one-off basis now i guess the, the question is i mean what are uh, what are political parties what are what are politically active groups doing to to kind of get people uh, to take the next step beyond just clicking the like button on a you know on a Facebook group in support of or or opposed to any you know particular piece of legislation and get them to actually you know volunteer their time for a cause or you know uh, go out to vote or sign up for a political party. In other words, kind of take it out of the virtual realm and and into the real world. Yeah, I think I think that's the key. That so much of this can go on online without going on to the next step and. Um, you know, a lot of actors in the political, uh, in the virtual realm, really, you know, aren't, aren't exactly set up to, you know, uh, to facilitate uh, people going into, the, you know, into the offline world and really taking action. But I, I definitely um, see your point because, um, particularly around like a recent example around the healthcare debate, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, citizen interest in that. There have been groups um, that have been forming um, discuss- a lot of heated discussions online, which I think is a good thing. Uh, quality discussions that have uh, been facilitated through uh, digital media. And I think the political parties, um, and it's interesting that you bring that up, because American politics is so candidate-centered and so personality-centered that uh, the national political party organizations, other than kind of providing the structure for contesting elections, has kind of fallen by the wayside in the campaign arena or, you know, even 
kind of between campaigns in terms of, you know, kind of really having a major uh, role and presence uh, for American voters uh, or American citizens. And um, through just in the ramp up to the 2012 elections, the parties have really tried to um, to kind of catch up and to use um, websites, very highly developed websites and a lot of uh, sophisticated social media to um, kind of bring voters back into the, you know, kind of party fold. And they have, uh, you know, they do provide lots of opportunities for, um, you know, discussion, but also to take action. And it's all kind of on the on the site. In terms, they're also doing some really interesting um, kind of strategies that deal with microsites. So if there is an issue like healthcare, they'll put up a very quick one or two page site that, you know, has resources, may or may not facilitate discussion there, but can send people to other places where, you know, they can navigate through the online platform and actually, you know, kind of figure out ways uh, to get involved, to contact members of Congress or even, you know, even further than that, uh, volunteer opportunities so that you can get involved and, uh, and lots of, you know, kind of resources to build their knowledge base as well. So I think there's a tremendous amount of potential there. And, you know, like I said, I think that what the political parties um, are doing in the U.S. in this particular election is kind of party building in the way that um, might be constructive because they will be there um, when the candidate sites go down as a consistent presence. And as of now, very few people go to political party sites, even these really wonderful sites. Um, but both of the parties are being very proactive with their um, social media outreach to citizens. And so maybe over time, they might be able to use these sites um, as they're designed to really be one-stop shops that will facilitate, you know, kind of knowledge gain, uh, discussion, engagement, and then take the whole, you know, for those who who want to take the next step um, so, to take them offline. Diana, it's interesting that you raised the, uh, the, the 2012 uh, U.S. elections. Um, you know, we certainly heard a lot uh, in, in the last uh, presidential uh, election in, in the U.S. Uh, about the emergence of, of social media as, as, a, as a major driver, uh, you know, of, of engaging younger people. Would you say that the uh, the 08 election in particular, the uh, uh, the, the Obama Democratic uh, campaign was a, a bit of a model for, for how to use uh, uh, social media to engage people, or is it uh, a bit overrated in that regard? I would say that it's absolutely a model for how, how, how to engage people, and particularly young people, using social media, but I think it's almost a model that um, had that one shot. It was almost like a perfect storm, and oh, yes. there's a lot of reasons why. Part of it had to do with the electoral context, that you had, you know, it was an open race, and you had a candidate, one candidate in particular, who um, was very appealing to young voters. But a lot of the initiative for using uh, social media in the campaign came, you know, kind of spontaneously uh, from young people just working outside of the context, the formal context of the candidate organizations or the political parties. You know, kind of over time, the Obama campaign was very, you know, very successful in corralling that energy and kind of bringing it more centrally into the campaign. But it was innovation that, you know, kind of young people initiated on their own. What's happened in 2012, and I think this is one of the reasons why we have a a smaller percentage of young people engaging, among other things, um, among the fact that they're not overly thrilled with the candidate choices and some other things. But the parties and the um, campaign committees have now kind of co-opted all of those tools and kind of taken it over. So, you know, the, you, you could still innovate, but it's it's the, it's not as if young people are owning that anymore. And uh, so I think that it was really, you know, a landmark election um, and, you know, and something that, um, you know, kind of the spontaneous type of innovation that occurred, um, you know, on, on the part of young people just engage in that way is something that, you know, kind of maybe a historical artifact that, you know, now once it's been co-opted, we're not going to be able to reproduce those same conditions again. I could be wrong. The next <laughs> wave of technology might have, you know, the same kinds of uh, effects, but... I think in the short term, and the foreseeable future, um, we're going to get more of what it's like, you know, in 2012, where it's now been become very commercialized and, and very much, you know, taken over by formal organizations and takes a little bit of the, the fun out of it for young people, I think. Okay. Um, just before we let you go here, is there one lesson that you think Canadian politicians and, and politics in general needs to learn about social media? 
Yeah, I, I think Canadian politicians, American politicians, American candidates really need to be um, a lot more judicious in their use of, of social media. And um, and I, I just fall back on the examples that you gave earlier in the Canadian case. I can give you a million examples in the American case. Right now, the whole goal is to just flood the market with as many messages as possible, just, you know, kind of oversaturate and hope that something sticks. And what I would like to uh, what I think would be a much more effective strategy and I think would be better for, you know, kind of citizen engagement and other kinds of, you know, kind of democratic initiatives is if politicians would use it judicially, judiciously, carefully, and figure out, you know, and, and think before they, they post, um, figure out what would be the consequences of um, particular actions that they, that they do on social media and uh, not just be so concerned with pushing out content um, you know, just in massive amounts. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, and thanks for the great questions.